Okay. Hello to everyone tuning in tonight. My name is Callie Kelsey, and I am the PTSA co-president at Degano Middle School. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Degano's PTSA, Migrant Matters, and, on our, and our amazing partners at Rady Children's Hospital. Tonight is bound to be one of the best events yet with the topic of understanding a teenager's brain, neuroscience explained with Dr. Zhang Ro. Before we get started, I would like everyone to know that this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be available in the near future on the Degano PTSA website. All right, let's get started. Tonight we have a very special guest, um, well actually a couple, but um, our very own principal, Ms. Kara Dolnick is joining us on the panel. She's an incredible person that has awed me time and time again with her passion for our youth and our community. Um, Kara, I'd like to invite you to say a few words um, on behalf of Degano if you'd like to. Good evening, thank you so much, I appreciate it. And thanks um, for everybody that could join us. Um, I'm very excited um, that Dr. Rowe could be here tonight. Um, I, this is one of the things I think that is fascinating to me is, is just that the, the neuroscience of the brain, and it's actually something I was, I was telling you guys before that we talk with our incoming um, elementary to middle school families about some of the things that they're going to see different with their kids as they're um, kind of developing um, in, in the adolescent years. Um, and I also want to thank um, all of um, the Radies um, team who has just brought some amazing um, of our parent talks and parent engagement series. It's been just fantastic and our parents really appreciate it. And Callie, I can't say enough, enough thank yous to you um, for, for bringing this and, and making this partnership happen. So thank you so much. And, and Dr. I'm very, very much looking um, forward to this and I think it might even be something that I'd, I'd love to share with my teachers once um, once we kind of get moving again. I think sometimes we need reminders that sometimes our teenagers just their brain really does work differently. It's not just it's not just us. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much to you, Mrs. Dolnick, for um, giving us the opportunity to bring this to the school and to offer these opportunities to parents. Um, now, I also have the honor of introducing another Shiro of mine, Ms. Dominique Hensler. Dominique is the Senior Director of Care Redesign Planning and Mental Health Integration for Rady Children's Hospital. She focuses on transforming mental health and emotional well being to improve the health status of youth and families. And she believes that a focus on family centered care is essential to transform care and improve the health of patient populations. Dominique, the floor is yours to share the incredible things that Rady Children's is doing here right in our community of San Diego. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you, Principal Dolnick and the um, parent community for welcoming Rady Children's and my esteemed colleague, Dr. Zhang Ro, this evening to talk about a look at a teenager's brain, neuroscience explained. We are very fortunate for this partnership because at Rady Children's, we have a goal to transform mental health. We want to look at the whole child's well being. There is no health without mental health. We're not a sum of our parts. We have to look at care holistically. And many of our programs are aimed at transforming the way we look at holistic care and improving the overall care and um, way that we can identify children's um, mental health needs earlier and then intervene with a variety of programs. So we're very, very excited to be able to work with Callie and others on um, communicating tips and strategies and tools of what we can do, especially during this time of COVID as our youth are struggling. And we also, as part of um, our strategies, are doing community-based education such as this evening. So we are truly, truly fortunate to have Dr. Rowe speak with us tonight from UCSD and Rady Children's Neurosciences and Callie will be introducing him. And when I say we are fortunate, his depth of knowledge and the way he can explain it is going to have such an impact 
for all of us on being able to take this useful information and have new insights and understandings on um, our youth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dominique. Um, I am so excited, so excited for tonight. Um, quickly, let me remind everyone that at, um, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and it's available for you to send in questions throughout the event. Um, and these questions will be answered during a Q&A at the end of the presentation. The chat box is also available for any thoughts that you wanna share with panelists during the presentation. Um, you know, it's kind of amazing, but um, I usually will shorten bios just a little bit um, for the speakers that come on just based on the topic or what's going on. But with Dr. Rowe, it was an impossibility. I truly could not um, shorten his bio whatsoever because of how incredible it is. So let me go ahead and share it with you. Um, I'm honored to introduce the man of the hour, Dr. Zhang Ro. Dr. Ro is the division chief of neurology at Rady Children's Hospital San Diego um, and professor of neurosciences and pediatrics at UCSD School of Medicine. His clinical expertise is in general pediatric neurology and pediatric epilepsy with an emphasis on, I hope I can say this correctly, um, pharmacological therapies and metabolic approaches toward epilepsy treatment, such as the ketogenic diet. His main research interests are the mechanisms underlying the anti-seizure and neuroprotective effects of the ketogenic diet and its clinical variants. Dr. Rowe's research activities have been funded by grants from the National Institute of Health, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Brain Canada, and a variety of intramural and extramural public and private sector sources. Prior to his current position, Dr. Rowe held full-time academic faculty appointments at the University of Washington in Seattle and Seattle Children's Hospital the University of California and Irvine and University of Arizona and State Arizona State University at Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix. And most recently, the Alberta Children's Hospital and the University of Cal Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Dr. Rowe completed residency training in pediatrics at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, um, followed by a dirt adult neurology and pediatric neurology residency and fellowship training at the University of California, UCLA um, Medical Center. He also completed a research fellowship in neuropharmacology at the National Institute of Health. Dr. Rowe received his undergraduate degree in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale University and his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati. As you can tell, Dr. Rowe is extremely smart and we are beyond lucky to have him with us tonight. Um, Dr. Rowe, I am so excited again and we are so grateful to have you. The time is now yours. Thanks very much, Callie, and thank you, Dominique. Uh, um, I, I think my wife would probably disagree with the comment about you know, being smart around the house. <laughs> As she say, I'm maybe book smart, but you know, uh, <laughs> sort of practical things, it's a whole nother matter. Uh, so I'm glad you uh, presented the fact that I'm, I'm a pediatric neurologist. Um, my my uh, efforts really have been focused around developmental neuroscience. In other words, uh, you know, what happens uh, when the brain is formed? Uh, what are the things that occur in early infancy, childhood, adolescence on, on its trajectory to become an adult? And so I do a basic science research in the area, mostly in the area of biochemistry of the brain, uh, but I've also spent some time thinking about uh, neurological diseases and how best to treat them. So this is a perspective that I'm going to bring to you tonight in sort of a, a glimpse of what are the important things to recognize about a teenager's brain. Uh, in, the, in the next 30 minutes, it's, it's really impossible to kind of relay the complexity of this unique stage of human development. And what I'm going to do is to sprinkle a few thoughts for further discussion, further, further research, and I hope that this will kind of launch a further appreciation for the fact that the adolescent brain, teenager brain, 
is not just something caught in between a large spectrum of development. It's very unique in its own way. And the more we understand about the uniqueness of the teenager's brain, the better we can actually manage, handle, and importantly, support the teenage brain so that it becomes the best possible adult brain out there. So we're going to start with the, just sort of maybe an appreciation of the brain. Uh, I, I'm biased, but I think of this as the most important organ in the body, of course. Today, Imagine. Sorry for the video here. You'll laugh and move and wrestle. You'll feel and worry and wonder. You'll engage and embrace and dive in. You'll persevere and push on. You'll reflect and ruminate and radiate. You'll do this because of one inexplicable organ. Welcome to the wonders of the brain. So we're gonna start with a few fun facts, uh, some things that you may not be aware of. Uh, first of all, uh, in a mature adult and in, in late stage adolescent, uh, the weight of the brain in kilograms is uh, over two and a half pounds, uh, 1.3 kilos if you're in the uh, sort of the outside the US. Yes, this is brain, very small relative to the rest of the body. At rest, it generates the same amount of energy as a, a light bulb, you know, 10 to 23 watts at rest. Uh, when you're consumed with activity, it actually might go up. And certainly along those lines uh, at rest, 20% of the total oxygen and the blood supply of your entire body goes to your brain, even though your brain only weighs about two and a half to 3% of your whole body. There are a number of blood vessels, both large and small, about 100,000 miles of blood vessels in your brain. That's about the same life expectancy as a car. Uh, what about each brain cell? How are they connected to each other? Each cell has thousands of connections with other cells. So, you know, how does your social, social circle compare to the ones that are established by the brain cells? And the other fact that you may not be well aware of, uh, during development, all those brain cells have to multiply and move to the various targets to create the brain as we know it. They're close to 100 billion cells in that little area of the body known as the brain. Now, with time, uh, with you know, aging and, and disease, uh, certainly the numbers can be affected. It's certainly true that as Isaac Asimov said many decades ago, the human brain is the most complicated organization of matter that we know. It remains that way. And, and the more we learn about it, the more questions that actually arise. So you might be asking, well, how does the human brain compare with other species? This is a figure uh, from a scientific paper that illustrates the size of the human brain in relationship to other primates, as well as down to those pesky little rodents, uh, rats and mice that we sometimes uh, get annoyed with in the, around the house, but are essential for some of biomedical research advances over the years. And the question you might be asking is, well, you know, does size matter, right? Is, is big necessarily better? Well, it turns out that it may not be the case. So if you compare the human brain with that of an African elephant, the elephant's brain is actually bigger, but yet one could argue that in terms of human development impact on the world, both good and bad, unfortunately, uh, the human brain, you know, is probably more complicated, more accomplished than that of the African elephant. And certainly the best human example here is Albert Einstein himself. You know, after he passed, uh, you know, scientists were very curious as to how someone like him would create sort of earth-shaking concepts of relativity and space and time and travel. And it turns out his brain was actually kind of smaller than the average adult brain. So what was unique about his brain that gave him such incredible insights about the universe? But well, we're still trying to figure those uh, questions out. The other question you're, you're probably asked over time is why is our brain wrinkled like a walnut and, and why isn't it smooth like a, like a mouse? Certainly the smoothness uh, you know, may be more elegant. In point of fact, uh, it's been argued that the reason why it's wrinkled is because we need a lot of brain cells and we need a lot of connections to make our human activities a function. And so it's a matter of surface area. If you kind of wrinkle it all together into a smaller space, you have more surface area. It's been estimated that the average adult human brain, if it were spread out, would cover up to probably two uh, pages of a standard newspaper, right? And over time, uh, when we develop more and more brain cells and more capacities, you know, are we constrained by just space? Well, maybe, uh, I don't know. Maybe this is a way of preventing us from looking like this 
as opposed to how we look today, right? So there's some spatial and structural reasons why it is shaped the way it is. Now in pediatrics, you know, we're very concerned about the developing brain, right? Uh, as I said before, you know, simple cells have to divide it to create hundred, you know, hundred billion cells. So in gestation, you know, the fetus actually grows and this is how the kind of the brain develops and then ultimately becomes wrinkled to provide more surface area. And the most important things that we define as being human are actually developed in the first few eight years of life. And so we pay a lot of attention to what happens early on in infancy and childhood. But we sort of forget the fact that the teenage brain is also developing in different ways. And it's become some, somewhat of a social mockery you know, to say in those lots of quotations about the challenges that adolescents provide you know, adults and the kind of unusual behaviors, the way they disconnect and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Their impulsivity, uh, their, their lack of foresight and planning and understanding the consequences, et cetera. Or just plain, they're just not social. They don't like talking, they're moody. They're, you know, it's difficult to engage. And the question has always been, what is the basis for this, right? And so it goes back to sort of the idea, is it sort of nature or nurture, right? Were they kind of born or destined to be that way? Or is it something about the environment, uh, particular to the family or to society as a whole uh, that is influencing these behaviors? It turns out, you know, we often historically have blamed teen turmoil on the immaturity of the brain. We call it a half-baked brain, right? Not quite mature enough to be able to understand and to be like adults. We treat them like kids and babies sometimes, but we expect them to act like adults, right? So did, they, did the brains cause the turmoil or did the turmoil externally shape the brains? It's probably a combination of both because uh, it's never really one or the other uh, as, as more evidence comes out. Actually, in truth, during adolescence, uh, studies of intelligence, perception, and memory show that teens are actually in many ways superior to adults. And it's been found by, you know, and, and there are more than just anecdotal examples of this, that when we treat teens like adults, engage in a mature understanding way, they can actually rise to the occasion. And many phenomenal teenagers have been able to accomplish things that adults themselves could not do, right? So there's clearly something unique and different about this particular age that affects brain function and the capacities that are lie within the brain. So this is a, an article uh, from Scientific American from 2015 that I would highly encourage you to look at if uh, you know, interested in reading about this some more. Uh, the con this article is actually written by one of our psychiatry faculty here at UC San Diego, Dr. Dr. Jay Gee, who's been a pioneer in studying the adolescent brain development using MRI techniques. And so this actually depicts some of the key lessons that we have learned over the years about the uniqueness of the teen brain. The teen brain is often ridiculed as an oxymoron, sort of a conflict of words, uh, uh, an example of so-called biology gone wrong. But if we understand it properly, it could be the flip side of that. It could be a biology gone right with the greatest degree of potential for the future. And we must also remember that, you know, we're all once teenagers, <laughs> in addition to just being babies, you know, and, and we became adults and what we do in life as adults uh, really are predicated on what happens early on, but also extending through adolescence. So let's look at this in a little more scientific detail. Um, you know, when we look at the uh, immature brain of a five-year-old, a preteen, a teen brain, or of a young adult here, uh, and we look at MRI techniques to measure sort of uh, thickness and and sort of functional measures using MRI techniques, you know, we'll see that uh, there's a gradation here. You know, early on, you would expect certain areas of the brain to be immature, but over time, they become more and more mature. Turns out the teen brain has an area of the brain that is kind of delayed in terms of maturation. And I'm going to go into this into a little bit more detail. So the brain itself is not just all about size, okay? I, I hope I've kind of communicated that earlier on. It's about the, the, the creating the network, having different parts of the brain talk to each other in a coordinated way so that you can not only perceive properly, but to cogitate, to plan, and to take action, right? And so maturity in many ways is determined by how the different parts of the brain coordinate their communications, 
right? And, and so the more it does that in the developed network, the greater the capacity to do complex things that we define as being human, right? So stronger connections, uh, sort of the resilience of those connections, the stability of those connections allows us to do the things that mature adults are supposedly able to do. But one very important sort of developmental thing that occurs throughout adolescence is this phenomenon known as myelination. In other words, the brain cells are connected by these fibers uh, and the fibers have to send signals in order to communicate, right? So you can imagine that uh, if there are lots of signal uh, wires and you wanna be able to facilitate speed, you need to be able to sort of, you know, be able to communicate quickly across many, many cells, right? And one of the anatomic things that is uh, sort of important in this regard is this thing called myelin. So here's a picture of a brain cell. And this is a, sort of the fiber or the nerve or the axon is what it's called. And these little contacts go to other brain cells. There's a fatty sheath that encircles this axon or fiber. And this fatty sheath provides a, a sort of a physical measure of increasing the speed of conduction. So that the more myelin you have, the quicker the impulses can get from one cell to another, right? Uh, in fact, there are many diseases later on in life uh, where you have a destruction of the myelin. And what happens there is that you have impaired signal communication and that leads to neurologic and mental health problems. So if you look at this during development, here is a figure that shows the percentage of changes. And this, pay attention to the blue line here. This is the trajectory of myelin formation. And as you can see it in terms of years, it takes until early adulthood, about 25 years of age before myelination plateaus and becomes complete like an adult. So another developmental thing that occurs. Now, while we talked about many of the other things that create the brain occurring early on in life, myelination takes a long time to actually mature fully, right? So here's another important point about the, the teen brain. Uh, there are two critical areas of the brain that have to be sort of synchronized in order for sort of emotion and action and planning to be coordinated, right? So the first is called the limbic area. These are parts of the brain that encode or are responsible for emotion, kind of mood, uh, you know, attention, things like that. And then there's an area called the prefrontal cortex, which is the last part to myelinate. So that's a little bit delayed. The prefrontal cortex is involved with all of the so-called executive functions of human beings, ability to plan, to execute, to, to kind of you know, act like a mature adult, right? What we've learned over time is something that kind of provides a disconnect between these two developmental processes. So the maturation of the limbic area occurs fairly quickly, sort of coincident with the onset of puberty with all of the hormonal and physical changes that occur in, in preteens and, and, and it's becoming earlier and earlier for a variety of reasons. Um, the prefrontal cortex development actually takes longer and the myelination takes longer. So you can see here that over time in the last few decades, we've seen a spreading out of this mismatch between the limbic development and the prefrontal cortex, which actually in practical terms, what it means is there's a longer period of time that preteens and teens suffer or benefit from this disconnect, right? And, and this may be one of the anatomic explanations as to why some of their behaviors are the way they are and the ones that kind of provide challenges for all of us. So, you know, our goal uh, in society and, and at Rady and UCSD, you know, we want to optimize brain and mental health because without that, you know, we can't be the best that we can possibly be. Uh, optimize our, 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 our potential when we were born. Um, and brain and mental health in the United States has been sort of largely kind of focused on the adult population, the, the people that age and develop, you know, diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and things like that. Well, you know, brain and mental health, simply put, is making the most of the brain and helping reduce risks as you age. And age, not just when you're older, but aging when you're younger and during the critical period of adolescence. It's very sobering to recognize that up to one in three Americans will likely be affected by significant brain or nervous system disorder or injury during their lifetime, whether it's as babies, infants, children, 
adolescents, older adults, or those that are in the twilight years, right? So brain and mental health disorders are a huge challenge. It's a prevalent throughout society. And this is why there's such great attention focused on this you know, throughout the United States and under President Obama's brain initiative, some neuro or advanced technologies have been advanced to be able to better understand the brain. Now I'm gonna talk about sort of risks, right? So we have this developmental mismatch, this prolonged period where the limbic system isn't quite doing what it needs to do relative to the prefrontal cortex. And so what kinds of things are a consequence of that? Dr. Rowe? Yes. Can you check the volume settings for this video? We're having a hard time hearing it. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, no, that's okay. I know it worked earlier when we did rehearsal, but um, it's very faint. Okay. Uh, how do I do that in terms of the video? I'm sorry. Um, no, that's okay. That's all right. I know it's running off of your video uh, computer. Um, okay, so... While you're in Zoom, it might be audio hard settings. To I have it on maximum, actually. Do you? My daughter that's that's um, in with me right now just said that the best way for the volume to come is for you to mute yourself while the video is playing. Okay. We'll try that. Let's try that. <laughs> so, the young, the young. Yeah. Maybe not. Now we can't hear it at all. <laughs> yeah. So sorry, audience, if you could bear with us for a moment. Moment. Um, sorry about that. Uh, we're having okay. a little audio problems. It worked before. Let me try something different. Um, Danielle, remember when you have to change computer settings when I had to do that Vimeo video for a meeting a couple weeks ago? Is this one of those? Oh, we have advice. In the Zoom, you have to check the box at the bottom that says share screen that says to share computer sound. That's the one I'm talking about. A of Thank you. Emotional, intellectual, and social change. Our brains also Is that better? In this time. The developing brain is a learning machine, and from when we're born, it grows enormously as we learn more and more about the world. This means we end up with billions of connections in our brains, but many of these pathways are either too slow or not needed. It's during the teenage years that our brains are renovated, whereby most of these unnecessary connections are removed or pruned away. At the same time, the connections that are kept are insulated to allow for faster communication across the brain, a process called myelination. Pruning and myelination occur gradually over the teenage years and are greatly influenced by our experiences and interactions with the outside world including the alcohol and drugs we choose to take. Let's take a closer look inside the brain. The frontal lobes take the longest to develop. By about 25, they've become your center for decision-making, helping you to plan and organize, focus your attention, control your mood and behavior, and solve day-to-day -day problems. The temporal lobes are like an information processing center that builds your library for sounds, speech, learning, and memories. The cerebellum integrates your senses, helping you to balance, control, and fine tune your movements. The hypothalamus is involved in many functions, including the release of hormones that help regulate your temperature, hunger, thirst, and sexual development. And the brainstem is like the final checkpoint for information going to the body from the brain and vice versa. Alcohol affects the teenage brain differently to the adult brain because it's still developing and not all areas are fully operational. How you feel when you drink alcohol can be an indication of the damage it's doing to different areas in your brain. Alcohol affects the frontal lobes first, making you feel relaxed and reducing your inhibitions. This means you may talk more freely, act loud or rowdy, or do foolish things you later regret. As you continue drinking, your brain starts slowing down, reducing your ability to concentrate, make good decisions, and control your emotions and impulses. This means you might do things you otherwise wouldn't. In the hypothalamus, alcohol blocks the hormone that tells the kidneys to reabsorb water. This means more water is lost as waste. 
reducing the amount of water available to the brain makes you dehydrated, which explains the headaches and body aches you may experience the next day, otherwise known as a hangover. Alcohol's effect on your cerebellum is evident when you lose your balance and fall over or have difficulties with standing and walking. This is why injuries are so common when people are intoxicated. Drinking alcohol particularly affects a part of the temporal lobe called the hippocampus, which enables us to form new memories. Alcohol interferes with the transfer of information from short-term memory to long-term memory. So if you drink heavily over a short period, you may experience a blackout, meaning the next day you can't remember what you said or did. Drinking at a level that causes blackouts means you're also much more likely to do something you wouldn't usually do, and your friends may not be aware of how drunk you really are. During your teenage years, you need to look after your brain to keep it healthy, just like other parts of your body. Our scientists are learning more about the brain all the time, and research has shown that the damage alcohol does to the developing brain is not only short-term, but may be permanent. Look after your brain. It's the only one you've got. So that's kind of an explanation of kind of what's happening to the various structures uh, with one of the risk factors, which is uh, alcohol use in the adolescent population. Another one is actually traumatic brain injury. And so because of the increased activity, physical abilities, the impulsivity, et cetera, uh, you know, we not, not infrequently come to situations, whether we plan it or not, uh, to have you know, accidents occur that damage the brain. And traumatic brain injury in the form of concussion or more severe TBI is actually a fairly common thing that occurs uh, in, in the young. And if it leads to bleeding, then it can lead to long-term consequences. Certainly, uh, one of the things that we can do to help prevent uh, brain damage under those circumstances is to wear a helmet, something very simple, something very readily available, something that will protect our brain in its casing, right? And we want to avoid things like damage that causes massive bleeding, loss of brain tissue, and permanent changes that will impair the, the child's and adolescent's ability to optimize their potential. There's another risk too, and that has to do with sort of attention and sort of- Video uh, tonight with a graphic illustration of the combustible mix of teenagers, cars, and distraction. This is a warning not only for parents, but for anybody who gets behind the wheel. And here's ABC's Lindsay Jans. Watch as this teen distracted by her phone for roughly six seconds loses control and careens off the road. And this team, one hand on the phone, another on the wheel, just seconds before colliding with another car. Here's another playing DJ before running off the road. And another chatting to her friend, then plowing into the car in front of her. These shocking videos are all part of an unprecedented look at the number one killer of American teenagers, car crashes. In the most comprehensive research of its kind, the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety analyzed nearly 1,700 accident videos, finding distraction of factor in nearly 60% of crashes. That's four times the previous estimates based on police reports. What we call eyes off the road. The biggest distraction may come as a surprise. What was the most common? The most common was talking to somebody in the vehicle, exactly what we're doing. And the second biggest distraction? Texting and talking on cell phones. So, another risk. Uh, I'm going to talk next about sort of things that uh, have been sort of popularized and legalized here in the United States and elsewhere in the world, and that is uh, marijuana use. It's been known through various clinical studies uh, that excessive use of marijuana during this critical window of brain development may have long-term consequences that increase the risk of mental health disorders and cognitive capacity. We're talking about depression, anxiety, and other things that, we are, that, that have become epidemic in society. And so why does that occur, right? We're beginning to understand the basis of that. One thing is that certain compounds within the marijuana plant, uh, such as cannabidiol, CBD, which has been widely popularized in society now, it depends on how much you take. A little bit may be beneficial, 
uh, more may actually be very de detrimental. So here in a set of experiments that we actually did in our own laboratory, we looked at different concentrations of CBD and looked at the viability of brain cells in an area of the brain that's very critical for learning and memory called the hippocampus. And what you can see here is this is the control situation, but with increasing concentrations, you see many more dark spots. These are dead cells. These are dead brain cells that are occurring as a consequence. And we think one of the reasons why it does that is because it impairs certain aspects of the cell that are critical for energy regulation. So, you know, dose matters, amount matters, because uh, you can actually permanently damage the brain. Smoking, e-cigarettes, vaping, another popular thing that teenagers are actually highly prone to, to engage in. But little do they realize that in a cigarette, there are compounds that would be considered toxic uh, substances that you would find in the kitchen or somewhere else in the house. There are chemicals that are found in batteries, lighter fluid, uh, vinegar, sewer gas, barbecue lighter, industrial solvents, uh, toilet cleaners, insecticides that can be found in cigarettes, for example. But what about uh, you know, sort of the risks of this? Well, it turns out through the National Cancer Institute that in cigarettes, the standard ones that you can buy at the store, over 200 chemicals are known to be harmful with at least 69 of them that are known to cause cancer, right? What about e-cigarettes? Well, there are over 7,000 different e-flavors out there. Most of them have not been tested for any type of toxicity. Uh, and some of those ingredients can impair lung function. Long-term use of these, not quite clear in terms of brain function. Nicotine, going back to cigarettes. If you look at a PET scan, this is what looks at uh, sort of the energy utilization of the brain, how it uses sugar molecules, for example. If you look at a smoker versus a non-smoker, this is normal brain activity. The blue here in a smoker means most of the brain areas have significantly decreased energetic utilization, which implies that those areas of the brain are not functioning very well, right? And the effects of nicotine are broad, broadly all over the body. It's not just the brain. It can affect the lungs, the muscles, the GI system, the heart, the hormones, and then cause a number of very nonspecific changes such as dizziness, lightheadedness in the brain. So all of this kind of taken together uh, may be contributory to the epidemic of mental health problems that we're seeing in society. Uh, this is the latest CDC, Center for Disease Control in the United States, uh, estimates of what percentage of the population suffer from depression, anxiety, behavioral disorders. And what you can see here in the red boxes is that the ages of 12 to 17 have the highest risk for, uh, for depression and anxiety Whereas for behavioral problems, you know, it can extend down to a younger age, six to 17, for example. And interestingly, because of all the psychosocial stressors uh, related to our current COVID pandemic, it's not a surprise to healthcare professionals and research scientists that the incidence of acute adolescent psychiatric disorders have surged in the context of this pandemic that we've lived in over the past year. Globally, uh, if you look at the consequences post-adolescent mental health problems, which invariably leads to adult mental health disorders. Most of these conditions actually begin uh, during the adolescent second decade of life. Mental health illness has the greatest impact on economic output than any other form of disease on the planet, right? Not as recognized by most people, but should be because this is the one thing that is gonna stall us as a species uh, in society and, and will impair our ability to progress forward in all the right ways. So what can we do to preserve the amazing teen brain? And I focus on amazing because, you know, despite all of the you know, sort of the historical connotations of being immature and, and difficult to deal with, uh, the greatest capacity for flexibility actually exists within this uh, sort of age range, right? There are major factors that influence brain development. And these are somewhat not surprising, right? So our external experiences, whether we take drugs, uh, you know, the hormonal changes that may be due to normal maturation or for that matter, under disease states. The social networks, the interrelationships, parent, child, peer relationships, any form of stress. Uh, it's been more increasingly recognized that the gut microbiome uh, can be a critical determinant of mental functioning, right? And so that implies that there is a connection with diet and then physical activity and exercise. All those things can combine to influence how the brain actually develops and functions. So uh, not a surprise, 
a recent uh, you know, report from the American Academy of Pediatrics, about half the children of school age years in the United States don't get enough sleep. Teenagers in particular, you know, they're kind of busy doing a lot of things, whether it's you know, being on screen or socializing, staying up late, they're not getting enough sleep. All right, this is going to impair function. What happens when you don't get enough sleep? Well, you get irritable, you can't process very well, uh, you also can affect your immune system, increases the later risk of diabetes, as well as other medical problems. Exercise and activity is another very important thing to pay attention to, right? And it turns out that, you know, there was a really interesting experiment done in Chicago a number of years ago where uh, the school, school age children uh, were asked to uh, get a little exercise before they started the school. The ones that did and the ones that didn't uh, led to a completely different ability to score well on tests and their cognitive abilities. And the basic science of this has actually gotten to a point where it strongly supports the notion that exercise and activity is really beneficial for brain function and brain development. And in fact, this was highlighted in a recent Scientific American article in January of 2020, which looks at sort of the, the science behind this. Exercise can produce the birth of new brain cells. It can actually uh, strengthen the connections that are important for normal functioning. So a bit of exercise every day, actually good for you in terms of brain health. Diet and health. Uh, well, this has been sort of la laughed at for many years because of diet having sort of the connotations of being a fad. Well, in, in, in truth, uh, diet is critical to the fu fundamental basis of nutrition, and the nutrition affects brain. Not surprising, right? There used to be this old saying, you are what you eat. Uh, you know, I do a lot of research in this area. I prefer to say you become what you eat. If you don't pay attention to what you eat, it's going to affect your general health and your brain function. For example, if you were to you know, take primates, these are rhesus monkeys here, uh, Owen and Eeyore, right? Both were started on different diets when they were born. Uh, and one had a calorie restricted diet and the other one had a normal kind of ad lib kind of Western style diet. Guess which one had the calorie restricted one versus the Western style diet? The one on the left, Owen, uh, had the Western style diet. Well, so, you know, you talk about Owen, you know, from the office or Eeyore from, from Pooh, uh, the depressed individual here, who's laughing now? Uh, I think diet does make a difference in terms of overall long-term health. I'm gonna to touch now on the sort of the, another key area that we have to think about in terms of diet and nutrition and health. And that has to do with our microbiome. These are all the bugs that we kind of live with or coexist with. It gets laid in very early in life and it develops over time the organisms change in terms of their composition and all that. It can be influenced by environmental factors as well as genetic factors and internal factors, right? What we're learning is that the microbiome changes are correlated with brain changes. So if you look at the brain cell and how the connections and the complexity evolve over time, you know, through infancy, childhood, and adolescence, uh, the critical stages of brain development that form the brain as we see it as a structure, but importantly, the onset of mental health disorders being prominent in late childhood and adolescence, right? So the microbiome may be a critical determinant of that. So think about this, what you eat, what the adolescents eat may determine the changes in the gut microbiome can, can influence whether someone has the onset of mental health and other medical conditions. Diet and COVID-19, I thought I'd throw this in here because you know, we're living in the pandemic. Turns out that certain diets that are high in fat, low in carbs, and I think the key here is low carbs, not necessarily high fat diets. Uh, it changes the immune system. It makes it more resilient. And in fact, there is a hypothesis out there saying that if you're on a certain diet where you restrict carbs and maybe liberalize the fats, this might be a protective mechanism uh, through which COVID and other viruses and bacteria may be thwarted. Finally, you know, we've been told that, you know, we are born with our DNA that determines who we are, it determines who we become, right? Turns out that science has told us that that's not actually correct. DNA is not our destiny. It's just the beginning, right? And there's a new science called epigenetics, which talks about, well, you may have a set of DNA and genes that you're born with, but how they're expressed and how they influence your life may be affected more by the environmental influences and some of the chemical modifications that occur as a consequence of the environment. This field of epigenetics means that the DNA sequence is one factor, but chemical substitutions based on environment 
diet, stress, et cetera, can alter the way the genes are actually expressed. This is the, the wide burgeoning field of epigenetics. And that's probably more important in many ways in terms of our average general health outcomes. So it's, off, you know, it's been often criticized that you know, parents are at fault for everything. The, the, the teenagers and adolescents love to do that. Nature or nurture, either way, it's your parents' fault. But is it really? It's actually much more complicated than that. It's a combination of factors. And if we understand sort of what, where, what you know, teenagers are going through in terms of brain development and, and what the effects of external stress and environment are to their brain, I think we'll be, be able to better understand that this is much more complex than it seems. Right? We used to sort of lump uh, certain adolescent and human capacities into brain regions. Uh, we, we know that it's not that simple. It isn't just one part of the brain responsible for one type of behavior. It's the network. It's how, it, how the brain parts actually communicate with each other, how quickly they communicate with each other that dictates how we, healthy and how more mature, quote unquote, we actually have as a function of the brain. So the final take home message is this, understanding the uniqueness of the teen brain will enable parents and their teens to turn conflict into connection and form a deeper understanding of one another. This is one of the greatest challenges of, of parenting. And it's a great challenge for society to deal with because teenagers have often been sort of neglected. They're sort of out there as so-called, you know, sort of the offshoots of, you know, of, of humanity. It should not be that way. It should actually be the reverse. The greatest capacity resides within the teenagers for all the potential that they possess. And for that, that's re the reason why Rated Children's and UCSD has made brain and mental health a very strong strategic priority. So with that, I wanted to thank you for your time and attention. I'm sorry for the video uh, mess up earlier on, but. Um... Oh my goodness, Dr. Vero. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm just gonna clap from, from here and just say thank you so much for being here. Um, I really, really appreciated what you said when um, you mentioned that the teen brain could be seen as biology gone right with the greatest potential for the future. That was something that really hit home for me. Um, also, just the emphasis on becoming what you eat um, was something that I hadn't ever thought of. Obviously, you know, eating healthy is something that we're all attempting to do, I believe, but to, to see it in the way that you explained it through neuroscience was definitely different. And I really appreciate that. Um, the other thing that I thought was so important to hear for me as a parent was the, the awareness of treating them as adults because they'll usually rise to the challenge. That really spoke to me, so I really appreciate you sharing that as well. Um, we have a few questions to ask, and I actually have my 13-year-old daughter, Aubrey, here with me, and she is going to ask you the first question. So excuse me while I move the computer over to my darling daughter, Aubrey. And Aubrey, when you're ready, go for it. Um, I was going to ask, what's an easy way to stay focused during all day online classes? Well, so that's a unique challenge that we've been experiencing through the pandemic here. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I would say that, uh, you know, in order to maintain attention, attention is sort of basically encoded by many different areas of the brain. But there are certain types of activities that would kind of break up the monotony, kind of help you focus a little bit better. And I'll give you some examples, right? So doodling, you know, a lot of people used to say that doodling means that you're not paying attention and that somehow you're uh, sort of... Uh, uh, not serious and you're not going to learn what you're hearing. Well, it, in point of fact, actually doodling is a positive thing. It's a creative thing. It, it focuses attention, even though it doesn't seem like it. So what appears to be is not always the case. Uh, taking regular breaks during the day, right? You know, standing up, taking a walk, if you have like even five minutes to do that will make a difference. Uh, make sure that you pay attention on a regular basis to all those kind of regular life things that we do on a daily basis you know, proper diet, make sure you have something to eat before you, you know, actually go on Zoom, for example. Uh, we talked about activity, right? How about your sleep? Are you sleeping enough, right? Do you have good sleep hygiene? Uh, you know, because if you're only getting five or six hours a night and you're too much tied to the screen or other things or other distractions, you're, you're not going to be there present in terms of the, the Zoom itself, right? 
Um, I like to actually change my posture when I'm doing Zoom. So for example, I may be sitting down, but then I could actually stand up and maybe just sort of rock myself back and forth. I actually have a little bit of a boogie board in my office so back at home where I can get a little bit of physical activity there, right? Um, another thing, uh, you know, talking about diet, try not to consume too much in the way of sugar and carbohydrates and soda pop and candy and things like that, because that's going to, even though you, you feel like it's going to give you more energy, in point of fact, it actually interrupts a lot of the activities that you need in the brain to kind of focus, right? So, uh, so that's some things you can do, right? Make sure you pay attention to normal sort of healthy habits, uh, life skills with, you know, eating, activity, sleep, and that should collectively help to do that. You don't need drugs to do that, all right? This can all be done just by sort of our normal day-to-day -day activity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowe. And, and my thought is, um, Mrs. Donut, can we just get all of the kids' balance boards? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that down. Boogie boards for the, the, uh, the computers. I don't know if we can combine those. I like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah me too. That's I, awesome. I like a little the, the spinning thing too, right? It's sort of. I oh, mean, fidget spinners are great. Yeah. <laughs> for me too. Well, it's it's the, the, the grip exercisers that you can just kind of sit there and, you know, gain a little bit of physical exercise and, and, and hand strength. Uh, that works very well as well. I, I also have this little thing that I bought on Amazon where you can put your fingers and actually extend your hands out and do some exercises with your extensor muscles. That's another thing you can do. I mean, everyone has different sort of biases, but some kind of activity doesn't mean you're not paying attention, right? I'm glad you, I'm glad you said the, the doodling because my notebooks in college had just doodles all over, but when we have to sit down and just listen, that's, that's all I could do. So it's a sign I like of that you mentioned that. Sign of creativity. Yes, absolutely. Um, Dr. Rowe, just based on um, right before Aubrey asked that question, and thank you for answering that. I think that's helping parents everywhere, every single parent on this um, on this call, as well as um, you know principals and and others. Um, but to go right before that, when I mentioned how you said that teens can rise to the challenge mm -hmm. when you treat them as adults, there was a question that just came in that. Um, Kiri Van Hoos was asking, what does that mean? What does it mean for teens to, what do you think, you know, teens can rise to the challenge? And then can you also expand that with creativity and capacity? Yeah, so we have a reluctance to kind of uh, charge our teens with, with things that we consider adult type activities, right? Because we think they're not mature enough to handle it. I think we have to accept the fact that, yeah, they may fall, they may fail, uh, but they learn very quickly, they adapt very quickly. And they can be very creative in the way they tackle a problem. So we can't be too prescriptive in terms of what we want them or expect them to do. But at the same time, we can't sort of hold back and, and treat them like little kids saying, well, you're not mature enough to be able to handle this situation project. Obviously, the parental role is to sit back and support them in ways that enables their own capacities to come out, right? Now, I, I think uh, it, it's sort of a general thing about sort of when they, you you, they rise to the challenge, meaning they have the capacity, even if they fail, uh, you know, repeatedly, they have the capacity to eventually master and do things in a creative way that enables their abilities to grow and strengthen, right? So in a, in a sense, uh, parental ability to take that risk, to let them fail, to charge them with something that maybe they're not quite comfortable letting them do, um, that hurts them in the long run. It, it affects their kind of, you know, self-esteem, their confidence levels, uh, things like that. Uh, I think, uh, like speaking for myself, you know, during my high school years, uh, now a teacher told me, well, you go ahead and start this project and figure out something, right? Had to do with a summer camp for kids. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Uh, so we just kind of bounced it around. We met our teenage classmates, met together. And we batted it around and within literally two weeks, we put, together, put an entire program together that was run by teenagers and we were left alone to kind of do that. Of course, the teachers uh, were always available for questions and consultation and things of that nature, but it's kind of like sort of letting, letting your adolescent go, giving them some confidence, but always being back there to support them in case they need you. Wow, that was, that was such an incredible answer. 
there. And it makes me think of Dr. Carol Dweck with um, her growth mindset um, work that she's done. And just the, the, the reminder that when kids feel discouraged to, to allow them that opportunity to fail and right. say, you know, instead of saying, I can't do it, change that to, I can't do it yet. Yeah, right. Um, and they keep going. So I appreciate all of your thoughts that you just shared. Um, the next question is, what are the top three things you wish teenagers knew about their own brains? Well, so, you know, I, I hope I can communicate the, the following messages. Number one, the teenage brain is not an aberration of nature, okay? Uh, and it's really a very special brain with capacities that don't exist at any other time in life. So they should sort of seize that opportunity and realize how special the teenage brain really is, right? It is the most precious asset that they have because their potential as adults and what they contribute to their families, to society, uh, to their fields, you know, their professions, et cetera, are the, the foundations are really laid very strongly uh, during the adolescent years, right? The future is shaped by what happens during adolescence. So it's kind of like, yes, the, the critical structures may be developed early on in life when all those brain cells have to kind of multiply and, and connect with each other. But in one of the videos, uh, I mentioned uh, the alcohol video, that you know, there's an exuberance of proliferation and connection that occurs early on in life. But when you get to the teenage years, you prune them. You take away the unnecessary connections. You strengthen the ones that are important for future adult-like function, quote unquote, right? And so I think that, you know, the message that the potential is there uh, and, they, and then the other message is pay attention to things that could hurt your brain, right? Some of the things that we touched upon in the presentation because some of those things are irreversible. You have to live with the consequences of that, right? So those are the things that I would emphasize uh, to the teenagers with regard to the brain. Thank you. Um, sorry for the, the second uh, disconnect. I keep trying to write as fast as I can because there's so much goodness here. Um, I'm also um, so grateful that this is being recorded so that I can watch it time and time again because there's so many little um, tidbits of information that I know I will be going back to, to listen to again. Um, so thank you for sharing those things. Um, okay, the next question is, are there specific ways I should handle my teenagers' mood swings while keeping in mind that their brain is still developing? Yeah, that's one of the be be biggest challenges in parenting, uh, the, the mood swings, the impulsivity, the behavior, the social disconnectedness, the isolation, et cetera. There's no simple answer to this. And uh, the methods that are, have been reported to be effective vary from individual to individual. So you have to kind of, take a step back first and ask the question, you know, should I re respond to this in a, in, a, in, a, in a negative way or in an aggressive way? Am I going to sort of add fuel to the fire, so to speak? Or am I going to accept this as sort of normal behavior, right? As long as it's, you know, sort of within certain boundaries. Certainly, uh, I think parents would, you know, parental educators and, you know, counselors and psychologists would tell you that, you know, it's not a freebie or free for all, but you know you have to kind of establish some sort of reasonable boundaries uh, in, in case uh, behaviors become extreme. But to the extent that it's within the normal realm, you know, for for example, if they're moody one day, don't pick a fight with them, right? Uh, because that's only going to lead to an escalation. They may yell four-letter words at you, and then that's going to just make things a lot worse, right? Um, Better yet to sort of sit there and say, well, well, why are they moody? Um, you know, it's not just about the brain disconnect in terms of maturity. Maybe there's something happening that they are not able to express. So you go to them and you just make it clear that, hey, you want to talk? I'm here, right? Don't make it aggressive. Don't be sort of, uh, sort of, you know, controlling it in, in ways. Um, don't react in anger. Um, you know, it's hard. It's easy to say. It's hard to do, right? Pick your battles. Some are not worth fighting. So if your teenager decides to kind of wear these weird clothes with weird colors, you know, do you want to pick a fight? Uh, you know, if they're doing something more inappropriate, then you might kind of point out and say, no, that's not going to work. You know, you treat them as an adult 
even though their brain's not quite there yet, right? Um, I think, you know, there are more extreme situations where you do need professional help and family counseling and things of that nature. Uh, there, there's no shame or, or negativity in that. I mean, uh, it's a tough time, especially now uh, for, for teenagers and adolescents to go through what they're going through. At the Children's Hospital, I can tell you right now, we're getting a lot of referrals from uh, primary care pediatricians and family docs referring teenagers for all kinds of sort of behavioral neurologic symptoms. And the good news is most of them are actually sort of a conversion reaction to the stress. They're not primary neurologic problems that are more devastating, right? This is all related to kind of somatic or physical manifestations of stress. Um, and so that just kind of highlights, you know, uh, their sort of difficulties in, in managing isolation, you know, Zoom schools, et cetera, et cetera. They need activity. They need to be out there. They need to kind of test the water, so to speak, in the real world. And the inability to do that makes it really hard on them. And it's hard on everyone right now, but we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it when you just gave us kind of a, the solution when things are going hard, when kids are having, or teens, kids are having mood swings to, to focus on not escalating the situation and then stopping, taking a pause and thinking, what may be happening for this to be what's going on? Right. And the third thing, which was, you know, let them know, let's chat, let's talk. You can talk to me and I'm here to listen. That's right. I thought all three of those things were very tangible um, solutions to, to a situation that could escalate easily otherwise. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, okay, the final question that I have, um, is do coffee and tea affect microbiome? Well, yes, it does. Um, you know, virtually everything that you eat or drink uh, can affect the microbiome. The question is, does it affect it in a positive way or a negative way? Or even if it changes, there's no uh, significant consequence to that, right? So, you know, I think right now we're on the cusp of uh, trying to really understand the role of the microbiome in our general health and, and indeed in brain health. So the good news is here in San Diego, uh, we have one of the world's experts on the microbiome, uh, Dr. Rob Knight over at UCSD. And there's a strong partnership that's been established with Ravy Children's. And there's now a new program that's been developed to kind of study the effects of the microbiome on, on drug effectiveness for mental health disorders, for example, or even brain or even forms of cancer for that matter. And so we're at, we're at the really exciting phase here of trying to uncover what those relationships are. And over time with increasing research, we'll be able to answer those questions and, and sort of maybe you know, manipulate the microbiome in a way uh, that will be ultimately beneficial for each and every person that gets you know, treated. That's incredible. That's incredible. I can't wait to learn more about all of the things that, that are happening um, specifically with that research and those partnerships that are that are happening now. Um, thank you once again, Dr. Rowe, for joining us this evening. Thank you to all of the parents and community members that are listening. Um, a special thank you to Brady Children's Hospital and the incredible team that makes all of these events possible. Um, also, thank you to Mrs. Dolnick for being here this evening with us as a panelist and um, as such an incredible um, part of our community and um, person in our, in our children's lives. So thank you to every single one of you. Um, I wanna invite everyone to mark their calendars for next month's event that will be on April 8th at 6.30 p.m. And also after this is over, which is almost right now, um, feel free in the next week to go on to the Degenio PTSA website to see this recording and others from the parent engagement series that have already taken place. Um, once again, thank you to every single person that's here. And I hope all of you have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.